But um, I, this morning, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach a message a little different than I really planned on. I started a series last week out of the life of David, but just couldn't get any traction on it this week, to be honest with you. And uh, I gave up arguing with God after a few days, and he said, okay. I said, do it your way. And he took me to a very familiar passage of Scripture that I'll, that I'll read here momentarily uh, with you. Um, but so I, I know for me personally, this was something God wanted to encourage me with this week, but one of those weeks that I feel strongly, maybe it's just one person here, maybe it's somebody online that's listening somewhere around the great globe, uh, that you need to hear this truth this morning. I pray it'll be an encouragement to you. I entitled this morning's uh, message, Who Loves Me? Who Loves Me? Nobody knows. Jennifer does. I, I got Jen and I got... Addie Boo Ray in the back. The, you know, I got my granddaughter and my wife and maybe my daughter back there and my son-in-law, probably not. Um, <laughs> who loves me? And the verse is a very familiar verse of scripture that most of us in here this morning, if you've known the Lord any length of time, you probably haven't memorized. Um, and if you don't, it's a great one to have memorized. It's found in Galatians chapter number two, Galatians chapter number two, and arguably maybe the most uh, famous verse in the entire book of Galatians, uh, certainly maybe one of the ones in the New Testament, Galatians 2.20. All right, remember this verse of scripture? I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Now here's the phrase that I couldn't get out of my mind, that the Holy Spirit said, stop right there. One that I've always just in this verse just read right over. Who loved me, who loved me and gave himself for me. Well, I want to take a couple minutes and talk about who loves me, who loves you, and I hope it will be an encouragement to you. Let me pray real quick, then we'll get into our message this morning. Lord, it's been so good. Thank you for the singing and the good spirit that's been represented here this morning. Thank you for each individual that's here, for folks that are listening or watching online. Uh, bless them as well. And God, now as we take a few minutes and look into your word, may it speak to our hearts. And Holy Spirit, may you do the work that really only you can do um, and bring illumination, conviction, wherever it is necessary. And may we leave here today with a greater uh, understanding of the great love that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. When it comes to love and how you feel loved, there's, there's a lot of uh, consequence to uh, healthy versus unhealthy reception of love and ultimately leads maybe what you want to call today to healthy or unhealthy self-image. If you grew up in a home that was surrounded by a lot of love, you may have certain traits. And if you grew up in a home that, that, that was devoid of that, you probably have other issues you're dealing with. And all of us, uh, unless you uh, grew up in, I don't know, did anybody here grow up in the perfect house that your parents always loved you and did it perfectly? We'd really like to hear, you, could you write a book for the rest of us? Because uh, the rest of us are trying to figure it out. And yet we talk a lot today, and rightly so, and our culture is very confused on what is a healthy versus unhealthy self-image. Now, to give you an illustration of this, Pastor Danny had no idea that I was going to go here, but it was good. We talked about our upcoming men's cornhole competition and that, that there were going to be trophies. And I was sitting in my thing saying, please, Pastor Danny, do not say that everybody that comes is going to get a trophy. Because that is antithetical to the old philosophy, right? Uh, you don't get it. If you lose... The rest of us are going to remind you that you lose, <laughs> and you stink at cornhole, all right? And we'll probably even get an announcement slide for it. But I, I, I went online, and I found a couple of memes that might express this, the, this healthy versus unhealthy self-image. And the first one looks like this. It says, this is what happens when every kid gets a trophy. <laughs> 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 oh, man. Don't we got one 80-year-old guy already running things? Do we need another one that's a flat-out socialist communist? No, I don't think we do. And that's how they all think. You know, everything's just for free and everybody's got to be the same. No, you get equality of opportunity, not equality of outcome. Amen? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll get on. I, I, that, next week's July 4th, so if you like that, come back next week. There'll be more of that, where that one came from. Um, but th there's this idea today that everybody gets a trophy. I remember, um, now, it was kind of coming in right when my kids were growing out and our son was getting out of Little League. But, you know, when the kids are little, they in t-ball, they'd say, well, it really doesn't matter the score, and we're not keeping score. And at the end of the year, everybody gets a trophy, you know, and all the old-timers are going, ugh. You know, but what I always found amazing was the children, they knew what the score was. Yeah. 
You could tell them not to keep score all you want, but at the end of the thing, I could hear one kid after another come to the parents and say, did we win? Did we win? Did we win? Especially the boys. But then there's the other extreme of unhealthy self-image that is typified in what we call the tiger mom or tiger dad approach, and I, I found a nice meme for that. You're five years old? When I was your age, I was six. You know, there are some parents that put expectation out there to a level that, that no one can ever meet. And I think most of us probably grew up in a home that leaned one way or the other. I will tell you, my mom and dad are probably watching this morning. Uh, mom and dad, I, I think I was blessed to be in a, in a relatively balanced home. I really was. That's why I came out so good. I, you know, just kidding. All right? you know, tell my story here in a minute. All right? I'll, I'll balance that out. But I am so thankful to know that Jesus loves me. That the Bible in this wonderful verse says, who or God loved me. You know, we know the, the great anthem of the faith, maybe next to Amazing Grace, I would say maybe one of the, maybe the anthem is Amazing Grace, right? How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. But then I think of Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. <laughs> Man, I'm telling you, aren't you glad that Jesus loves you? Mm. Now this morning what I want to do, I want to take a couple minutes, and as I thought about this verse, and of course I want to present it to you in the context of uh, the letter in which it's given, the, the scripture in the book of Galatians, what are the consequences and results of knowing? If you and I accept, believe, and respond with the truth that Jesus loves me, because I would submit to you this morning that probably every single one of us has times in our life where we wonder if anybody really does. Or at the very least, we fear, feel very little love. One of the great things about being a Christian is this foundational truth that Jesus loves me. So I want to, this morning, very quickly, I want to share with you three principles or three things we can know uh, as a result of knowing that Jesus loves me. Number one, I want you to see the first result of that is that it frees me from bondage. It frees me from bondage and ultimately hypocrisy as well. Notice in our text, in, in Galatians chapter number two, we're going to go through really quickly here this morning. Notice the beginning of this chapter. The Apostle Paul says... Then 14 years ago, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation, and I communicated unto them that the gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which are of reputation, in other words, the important people, you know, the Peter, James, and Johns, uh, lest by any means I should have run or had run in vain. He wanted to make sure they were on the same page. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in, came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in G Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection. No, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with me, with you. Paul writes this scripture to the churches of Galatia, which is in present-day Turkey, and it's a book that's primary theme is that these people were getting back into bondage to work. Some of them were believing in order to be saved, they had to do certain things. And others believed that even after they'd come to faith in Christ, that if they really wanted to be spiritual, they had to obey certain parts or all of the Old Testament law. And Paul writes in this book to say, no, 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 the gospel of Jesus Christ says that God loves you and that, 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 that it is a free gift John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, the gift of eternal life is not based on you and I doing certain things and keeping a certain standard of righteousness, but God offers you and I the free gift of forgiveness and he died on a cross for your sins and mine, rose again, and as he lives eternally, so he now offers that gift to you, eternal life, if we'll simply believe in Jesus Christ for it. Have you trusted Jesus Christ this morning? See, Paul didn't have to earn God's love by obedience. He was obedient because he loved God. When you and I try to earn God's love, it makes us act in ways that are inconsistent with who we are. Paul sought agreement with 
Peter, James, and John and others, and he said, I want to get together and proclaim in the gospel. But he said others came in, and they wanted to add things to the gospel and say, but you got to do this. You know, you, the, the men got to be circumcised. You got, you got to submit to the Old Testament law. You, got, you can't do this, and you got to do this. And Paul says, no, I, I'm not going to give in to that, not even for an hour. And the, the principle I want you to see here today and this morning is that when you and I understand the love that Jesus Christ really loves us, it frees us from the bondage of thinking we must do something to earn his love. It runs totally counter to oftentimes, especially in our Baptist circles, this mindset that, that, that teaches all the relation with God is all about rules. That, that how long your hair is and what music you may or may not listen to and how you dress and this, that, and the other, all these different things. Now, each of these things may have some biblical principle and foundation that you need to research and ask the Holy Spirit of God what you do, but it needs to be motivated and founded under the principle that I'm not doing these things, that somehow God says, oh, good boy, look at you doing all these things. You know, I have found that when pastors and churches try to make people change by giving them man-made rules that are top-down directed, it's not nearly as effective as the Holy Spirit of God changing people from the inside out is they respond to the love of God. And the reason Christians aren't as close to God as they ought to be, especially in some of our circles, and by the way, I'm not afraid and I'm glad that Christians ought to take a stand. I'm tired, as I've already mentioned, of churches that won't get up and take a stand for, for life. They won't get in the pulpit and make anything that's controversial because they're fearful and hor or, or just weak need. I, I thought uh, I saw a friend of mine the other day and I brought something up and so I started looking and so uh, I'm just telling you as I saw maybe maybe this is different and if it is so I you know let me know send me a note later this afternoon and I I hope I'm wrong here uh, but but people like Beth Moore posts all kinds of things on Facebook yesterday not one thing about the sanctity of life you know you'll find Joel Olstein's page full of all kinds of wonderful things do this that but not one thing about the sanctity of life and I tell you something, but at the same time, if you and I, our relationship with God is only fixated by how our external looks, and if, and if we're accepted by a group of people around us, that's inconsistent with who we really are, because who you really are is loved by God. Galatians, Paul later in this letter would write of this very issue in Galatians chapter number 5, Again, a verse of scripture that many times is taken farther than or out of context, but verse 1 says, Stand fast in the liberty where Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. And he goes in and talks about circumcision and says, if you're going to take that, and that was a picture of the entire law, but he said, if you're going to do circumcision, you're, you're, you're a debtor to the whole law. In verse 4 of chapter 5, he says, then you're fallen from grace. He's not saying they're unsaved. He's saying as believers, they're not living by grace anymore. They're living by works. But in verse 6, he says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. That the faith we have in our walk with God is one that is not rooted in, here's a bunch of things I do's and don'ts I can't do, and I'm, I'm accepted if I do or don't do these things, but it's based on faith on God, what would you have me to do today that is foundationally based in love? That's why later on in that same chapter, in verse 13, he says, for brethren, you have not been called unto liberty, uh, only, you've been called unto liberty, but only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even this and this, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Paul clearly says, yeah, you're free in Christ. Doesn't mean you get to, <laughs> you know, you just do whatever you want to do. But, but what we ought to be busy and concerned with is not what is it that I want to do, but what is it that I can do for my brother and sister that shows love to them. You see, when I decide and believe that what is better for you and my job as a Christian is to love my neighbor as myself, it means that as a neighbor, I'm not going to have a loud drinking party with a DJ at one in the morning with my neighbor who's got four small children. I wouldn't do that. Why? There's an ordinance against it. I hope there is. <laughs> but if I really love my neighbor, I wouldn't do it. Why? Because I love my neighbor and I'm, I'm thinking about what's best for them. And so when I think about what's best for them, all of a sudden I put boundaries around myself. And in our spiritual walk, that's how our relationship with God ought to be. It's very much like parenting. When children are born, 
and you're rearing them up, do our children need boundaries? I can't remember which philosopher who it was uh, that said that, you know, basically children are little heathen that come out of the womb and we spend the next years trying to beat them down to behave. Because if you let a child just do whatever they want to do, they'll do some things, right? So if you're a good parent, you put boundaries around them. You, you tell them, don't touch the stove, especially when it's on. Because it's hot, right? And you put all these boundaries around them, but as they grow older, as you put those boundaries, be, and you did it because you love them, Guess what? As they get older, hopefully, when the child's 18 under normal circumstances, unless, you know, they have disabilities, if, if they're normal in the adjustment, you shouldn't have to tell them anymore not to touch the stove. Right? And if you've done it right and you love your children and you had a healthy balance, when your children become full-grown adults... You don't have to tell them how to love their parents. You just do it. And when you watch your parents grow older and need help, if you were brought up in a home founded on love, you don't need one to send you a rule packet on how you should take care of your mom and dad. You just do it. Now, you may have grown up at home where you didn't have that, and you said, I'm taking care of my mom and dad because I honor and respect them, and that's a biblical foundation, but let, can't we not all agree that, that the best way is when you have a healthy love relationship inside your family, and you watch the generations go by, that, that our children grow up, and they, they do and don't do certain things, not because you've given them a bunch of rules, but because they've, they've decided, I love mom and dad, and I want to do what's in their best interest, and this is a process of, of rearing them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, but again, if they've had a healthy love relationship, the, the that there should be no, there, there's not the need there. You see, love creates necessary boundaries. It just does. I've used the illustration many times. I'll use it again. If you say you love your wife and she's the most precious to you, then what are you doing looking at pornography? You, you say you love your wife, then, then you put boundaries of what goes in the eye gate, and you put boundaries in saying, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not going out to lunch with every single woman in the church by myself. No, I wouldn't do that because then I wouldn't be here next Sunday because I'd be in the hospital. And <laughs> I was in the hospital a couple weeks ago, as you all know, and you know, you know my, the ER bill was for my, for, you know, you want to know what it costs to cast, pass a kidney stone? $32,000. Better make a ring out <laughs> and insure it, you know. <laughs> the funny thing is, since we are provided wonderful insurance by y'all at the church and we are Blue Cross members, you know, we, the, the bill said that your bill is $32,700, but because you're Blue Cross members, our discount is $31,000. Isn't that a crock, by the way? And that's our medicine socialism today, and that's why it doesn't work. It needs to be free market. At any rate. Well, you guys are getting a whole bunch of knowledge here today, aren't you? And you say, boy, we get it all the way around. Bottom line is love creates necessary boundaries. But, you know, when you understand the love that Jesus Christ has, it keeps us free from bondage. And, and I have this freedom in Christ that I can, I'm going to choose to love Christ. And yes, I'm going to listen to wise people that say, hey, be careful in this area. You might want to put some boundaries here. But I do those things predicated on, man, I want to, I want to know God more. He loved me, and I, I want to have a love relationship with him. So number one, it keeps me free from bondage. Number two, it frees me from the insecurities of myself. It frees me from insecurities. Notice in verse number six, back in Galatians number two, as we go through this story, the Bible says, but of those who seem to be somewhat whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person for they seem to be somewhat in conference, added nothing to me. In other words, Paul said, I got together with the people, the big wigs of the church, the Peter, James, and Johns, and, and I told them the gospel I was preaching, and, and they said, that, that works for us. I don't have anything to add to that. Um, and, and he said, but contrarywise, verse 7, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision to the Gentiles was committed unto me, the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for that he had wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, in other words, to the Jews, 
and the same was mighty in me towards the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. They went in front of everybody and said, these guys are great. We, we totally endorsed their ministry, that we should go unto the heathen and that they should go unto the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. They said, hey, don't ever forget the poor. And, and Peter said, yep. And Paul said, yep, we got to do that. Um, so they, they, they agreed on that. But notice as we go on, verse 11, but... When Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For behold, that certain came from James, and he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them that were of the circumcision. And other Jews dissembled themselves likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as the Jews? Basically, Paul says when they came to town, everything was going great, but when they got to Antioch, they discovered that Peter, when, when the Jewish people from Jerusalem were there, he wouldn't eat with the Gentiles. But when the bigwigs were gone from Jerusalem, then he would associate with them, and Paul goes to Peter's face, and they have a little mano y mano. Now, wouldn't you like to have been a fly on the wall on that? The two most powerfully used men of the New Testament, obviously outside of the Lord Jesus, uh, having a disagreement. And Paul calls him out. He said before everybody, before a bunch of the, all the ones that were involved in it, Paul wasn't afraid. Ooh. You see, it's somewhere along the way, Peter had become insecure and worried about what other people thought about him. He didn't want the big wigs from the Jerusalem church, the mother church, the home church, to go back and say, man, Peter's running around with all those Gentiles, you know. He, you know, he, 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 he's just really, he's, he's not as spiritual as he used to be. But Paul, because he was secure in the love of God, remember even in Galatians 3, a couple, little, couple paragraphs later in this letter, Paul said this, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. There's no room for racism in Christianity. There's no room for sexism in, in Christianity. Men and women, we all come to the foot of the cross equal. We all, we all come as sinners, and we all can receive the, the love that God is offering. But the bottom line was that Peter got all concerned about what other people thought of him. So Paul confronts Peter to his face. You know, it's the reality is every single one of us, just by the way we are wired, are born into this life as sinners with certain levels of insecurity. And most of us, matter of fact, to some level, I'd say all of us worry about what someone else thinks. Now, a little bit of that's a healthy thing. I'm glad that you ladies took time this morning to comb your hair Look all nice because you're concerned about how one's, you know, and that, that's a healthy level. We appreciate that. And, you know, the ladies said, I'm glad the men, if, I hope you took a shower this morning because otherwise you men, you stink. We don't, we don't want to, we don't, we, you know, we, 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 we can appreciate that. But y you get what I'm talking about. When you become or I become so insecure that we're worried about what everybody else thinks, every circumstance we come in, we transform ourselves into whatever we think that group wants to see. That's why it is so difficult when we grew up, and if you're a teenager this morning, why I love having youth ministry here, it's hard being a teenager today. The expectations that are driven upon uh, the teenagers today from, you know, from the world's philosophy about you got to be good looking, you know, and, and who knows what good looking is anymore. You see people online and they've all been digitally touched up or whatever. Is that really them? You know, have you ever seen anybody in person and go, man, online, you look so good, but in person, man, woo, um, you need some megapixels moved around or something, you know? But when we're insecure about the love of God, it makes us change our behavior. And conversely, when we are secure, Paul went and dealt with a legitimate issue. Peter was wrong. But Paul wasn't doing it because he was trying to make everybody else see how in charge he was. He wasn't motivated by the fact saying, oh, watch how I tell Peter what's what. You see the difference? Instead, Paul is coming to Peter 
firm in the love of God, regardless if Peter accepts his, his correction or the people there or not, it was not going to hinder who Paul thought and knew who he was because he knew the love of Jesus Christ for himself. I thought of Ananias and Sapphira, remember in, in uh, the book of Acts? Everybody's given big offerings and they, they went and made and said, oh, we gave all this money when they really didn't. They, they wanted everybody else to have this high opinion of them. Why did they do what they did? Because they wanted everybody to think highly of them. And you and I know what it cost them. <laughs> they carried him out of the church. I thought about King Saul. Here he is, chosen, you know, the, the Lord says, you make you the first king, and if you do, you'll follow me and be obedient. I'm going to bless you. And, and you know the story of King Saul, a little shepherd boy, a little ruddy-looking, scrawny-looking boy comes along and slays Goliath. And from then on, King Saul is full of insecurity, worry, and, and ultimately, it literally drives him crazy. It drives him to jealousy and envy and ultimately hatred. And I find that Christians that are insecure in the love of God, you stay that way consistently. You become a person who's very envious, very jealous, very bitter, and ultimately you reside hatred in your heart for somebody else because you say, well, look what they have and look where they are and, and that's not fair. And How come I had this and blah, 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 blah. And you're insecure in the love of God and it makes you who you are. Peter lost sight of the love of God and instead went around like a little beggar putting his little hands out there. Please accept me. Please accept me. Will you like me if I do this? You know, one of the hardest things I've learned in my own life and um, pastoring for a long time now, I think that's pretty much true. We all struggle to accept the love of God. Oh, we might believe that it exists, but actually receiving it myself. Many years ago, there was an article in Parade Magazine. Some of you all remember Parade Magazine. <laughs> it goes back a few years, right? And there was an article in there about Americans and how they, they struggle. Um, and the article said this, 13% of American women, 13% of American women consider themselves pretty. So if we took that average, 10 out of 100 women, 5 out of 50 women basically feel like, consider themselves pretty. Now men, on the other hand, 28% of men consider themselves handsome. <laughs> See how that goes. The study went on to show that they asked the men and women if there's how, if you could change something about yourself, would you? 94% of the men said, yeah, there's something I would change about myself. 94%. So men are a little more vain than we'd let on. But women, 99%. You know, I, I read a story of some of you remember yesteryear of Charlie Chaplin. Remember this guy? I know we got some old people here. I got a picture if you don't know who he is. He was a silent movie star back in the day and one of the great comics of, you know, some of y'all, right? All, all the young people go, who is that funny looking guy? Um, well, he writes in uh, one of his biographies or one of the letters that um, because of his iconic look, people would have Charlie Chaplin look-alike contests. And, and he writes in Monte Carlo, he was overseas, he entered one of them himself. And he came in third. <laughs> so you and I need to be our best, you and I. Yeah, we're going to mess up like Peter did. We're flawed, but God loves you. Isaiah says, writing of the children of Israel, in Isaiah 49, behold, I've graven thee upon the palms of my hand. And in the New Testament, Jesus says in John 10, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my Father's hand. That God loves you and I so very much that we are wrapped in the very hands of God. Lastly this morning, I'll be done. Number three, the third thing that the love of Christ and recognizing it does is it 
frees us to recognize that he gave himself for me. He gave himself for me. Verse 19 says, for through the law... Through the law, I am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness were come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Paul says, he died and I died with him. And you know the theological truth that we were in Christ and he paid for the price of our sin on the cross. And as he rose again, then we have a promise of eternal life and we have a new life as well. And it's based not on law, but it's based on faith and grace. Paul says, when I tried to keep the law, that killed me. But when I died to the law, then I was able to be alive. In other words, when the law said, you, you're a liar and you're a thief and you have wrong thoughts and I, yes, I'm guilty, yes, I'm guilty, yes, I'm guilty, yes, I'm dead before God in the law, that's the opportunity I finally had to become alive because it's not until you and I understand that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior that we're ever going to turn to Him. And so Paul said, I recognize I, I could not meet the standards of the law and so I came to Christ and now I have this new life and Christ lives in me and the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. So I now live this love relationship. I live out the Christ life uh, through love. And when you and I try to keep the law and try to keep every expectation of the law, all it will tell you is that you fail. But instead, we should receive the love of God. You know, a couple last Friday night we had the, that singing group here, the Adams Road Ministry. I think I, I had Allie get me a slide. Um, wasn't that a blessing, you folks that were here that, that Friday night, hear those testimonies? How these folks, I mean, their mom was a professor at Brigham Young University. Um, wow. And how they came out of Mormonism. And I got a couple of those books that they got, and I've been actually, I, I ended up buying the Audible book, and I've been listening to the mother's testimony of how she came out of, out of Mormonism, and it's been overwhelming to me how many rules and things that the Mormon people have to do to believe they can secure the f highest form of heaven. It, you, in some respect, you can't come to church like this into the temple unless you have a, tech, a temple recommend. In other words, you got a little have a set, set piece of paper that says you are good enough to be able to come into the temple. And there are 14 questions that you must answer and have them all right or you cannot have a temple recommend. In other words, if you're going to mess around with the Mormon faith, they'll, they'll, they'll let you do it, but you're going to stay out there. And it's work after work after work after work, and I'm re listening to this book, and I'm going, Ben, I, I, I am exhausted listening to the things that are required of them, and yet I must say I'm somewhat admired of their willingness to do whatever it is necessary. Every Sunday morning, they have a three-hour service every Sunday morning. They have a teaching time, and then they have like a, like a sermon time like this, then they have a Sunday school time, then they have a fellowship time. Every, every week, y'all would kill me. <laughs> I'd be voted out of here in a minute. I love their title, though, and it goes back to Micah, one of these young guys that, as a matter of fact, I think the picture of Micah there when, back in his, when he was Elder Micah, when he tried to convert a Baptist pastor to, a, to Mormonism, and this Baptist pastor lovingly shared with him the gospel, and they kept going back and forth, and the pastor asked him this key question that he said he, he couldn't get out of his mind. He looked at him and said, isn't Jesus enough? He said, I could not get out of my mind. I started reading the New Testament, and the Holy Spirit began to work in my life, and I began to realize that all my works were as filthy rags, and that, 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 that were not, as Paul wrote, were not justified by the, the deeds of the law, and I can't make myself better. And he came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and trusted him by faith. My question this morning is, in your life that you're living right now, is he enough? Is he enough? And the truth of the scripture this morning is he is enough. He is enough when I feel inadequate. He is enough when I'm overwhelmed. He is enough when others reject me. He is enough when others betray me. He is enough when I don't feel loved. He is enough when I fail. He is enough when the hardships come. 
He's enough when the critics condemn. He's enough when my sins are many. He's enough when depression grips my soul. He is enough when I feel unworthy. He is enough when everything goes wrong. He is enough. Now very quickly, I always like to prove whatever I'm trying to tell you theologically. And I want you to see throughout the scriptures how God says that he loves you and me. 1 John 4, 16, and we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. John 15, 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. 1 John 3, 1, behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Amen. Ephesians 5, 2, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 4, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Romans 5, 5, and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith and that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. In other words, you and I cannot be full of the fullness of God. You cannot have that relation with God that we all say we want unless you're grounded in love and you know the love of Christ. Can't do it. You can work as hard as you want. You can set as many rules as you want. You can serve as many ministries as you want. But until you respond to the love of God and allow the love of Jesus Christ to fill you, you will not be full of the fullness of God. Romans chapter 8, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword or 9% inflation rate or a lousy president? No. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from what? The love of God, which where? Is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Case proved. God loves you. Who loves you? Jesus loves you. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> Got to be a little contrary, right? I think we all, I hope in your life, somewhere in your life, you've been blessed with somebody that demonstrated love to you on a very deep level. I know there are some here listening or maybe here in person that would say as a child, I never experienced that and my heart breaks for you. It really does. Maybe your acceptance and realizing that Jesus loves you is really, really hard because you've never really tasted that kind of love in this life. And mom and dad, though uh, I am a boundaries, I think kids need boundaries and rules, but they have to have love. When I was a kid, um, from the time I can really remember, um, I was born with a lot of health issues and I couldn't eat a lot of things and to this day I have very, very slim eating margin. I, just, I, I drive down the road and I see all these Mexican food places and Thai food and all that I can't eat. Um, and so I was generally the, the, in school was the smallest one in class. Uh, I had poor vision from my early childhood so I started wearing glasses when I was four or five years old, a little kid, you know, and I, I got teased all the time and, you know, picked on, which is one of the reasons I'm such a fighter to this day, you know. My first response is not flight. My first response is I'll punch you in the nose, you know. Not a good response as a pastor always, but, you know. But there was one person in my life. My mom and dad told me they loved me, but you know how kids are. Yeah, mom and dad, yeah, yeah. But I had a grandmother Bless her heart, she was about four foot, nine inches tall. Just a little lady, but a giant of a woman in my eyes. And I knew every time I would go to her house, no matter how bad of a day I was having, she just showered love on me. 
we used to go on family vacations, and one year, for several years, my dad and mom, for they were crazy people, drove from northern Illinois, from the Chicago area, all the way down to Padre Island, Texas. If you know where that is, it's right on the Mexico-Texas -Tex border with you know, my brother and sister and I in a station wagon, a Ford LTD station wagon, and driving all the way down there. I tell them to this day, you were out of your mind. What were you doing putting the kids in? But we drove all the way there, and, and one year we decided we'd cross over into Mexico and go souvenir shopping. So we crossed over into Mexico and went to these little shops. You know, back, even back in that day, you had to barter, you know, back, you know, you had to get your pesos and your dollars and all that kind of stuff. And I remember we're driving around this busy town, and we can't read the signs, and my dad's going down this thing, and all these cars are honking as we realize that we're on this little narrow street going this way, and it was a one way that way. Um, yes, dad, you did it. I still remember you went down the wrong way, and everybody was giving us, you know, hand signals to tell us they appreciated us being there. Um, you, know, <laughs> you know, even in Mexican, I can read that form of Mexican language. <laughs> I got it, you know, okay. Um, and so we're going up and down there, and so we finally found over, we pulled over, and, and we each had some money that we could spend. You could do whatever you wanted to do with that money. And I remember, I said, you know, I'm going to buy something for my grandmother because she's the person I love more than any other person. I had no other grandparents, by the way. My, my mom's, both my grandfather's, one was an alcoholic, one was a gambling addict and an alcoholic. I didn't see either of those guys my entire life. My, my dad's mom died of cancer before I was born, so I just had one one little tiny woman grandmother and yet she meant everything to me and so I said I'm gonna take my little allowance and I'm gonna buy her a dog now my grandmother I look back didn't even like dogs didn't even like them but I went to Mexico and I bought this little dog right here and my daughter's back there and she'll tell you this little dog has been by my nightstand since Allison can ever remember because I brought this back from Mexico and I gave it to my grandmother and she was just like, oh, it just means so much to me, thank you. And she put it on top of her television. That was back when you've got the little box television. She didn't have a big council. She didn't have that much money. And this little thing sat on, that, on top of her TV for the entirety that I could remember, you know, for, till she passed away. And when she passed away, that unexpectedly, and Jenny called me home from work one day and we stood in the house and I cried like a baby. And uh, then the hardest thing to do, is, and many of you have been there, was to go back into her little apartment and everything was just where she would have it and I knew, I knew how she did everything. And I went in that apartment and there, right next to her and on her little TV, was this, and the first thing I took out of there was this little dog. And I've kept this little dog by my nightstand ever since. I think, I think I had Addie, yeah, she got a picture, if you can't see it, there, there it is, it's just marble, I don't know. And amazing, if you know our life story, doesn't this look like a little salt and pepper schnauzer? Guess what kind of dog we had for 16 years? Salt and pepper schnauzer, right? Pepper. But I keep this by my side, and it always reminds me, God gave me a grandmother that when everybody else said, you can't do it, you're too little, you're too sickly, you, you can't. I remember my grandmother, back in those days, she would even have to bend down. I was a little kid, she would say, Ken, God's going to do great things with you. Ken, you're very special. And you know what? I believed her. I believed her. And it reminds me that if God could give me a grandmother that loves me this much, how much does Jesus himself love me and love you? Holy Spirit of God, I thank you for today's message. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your love. Your love that is offered freely. Lord, I pray if there's one listening today online or here in person that has never had a time in their life where they received your love gift of forgiveness and eternal life, my dear friend, I just would beg you, God loves you so very much, but he doesn't force himself upon you. That's not real love. He gives you a genuine choice. Would you choose him by faith, recognizing he died on a cross for you and rose again and offers you eternal life? Would you simply receive that gift by faith? But how about it, dear Christian? Have you been questioning the love of God in your life? Maybe you've had a lot of things going wrong. Maybe you've got health issues, financial issues, relationship. What are these? And you say, God, I, I just can't believe you really love me if all these things are going on. But this morning through your word, you've been reminded that he does love you. He gave himself for you. Holy Spirit of God, I pray we'd leave this place today secure 
in the love that you have for us. Help us to respond to others in love based on the love you have for us. Thank you again for the teaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand with me?